third quarter training for Benicia emergency response teams focuses on triage and emergency medicine. Slow events that follow an injury. So as we discussed earlier, if you fracture a leg or an arm, if you have severe burns, you may result in death, not immediately, but within several hours. Those deaths should ideally occur in the hospital setting. You should have been able to triage everyone and rapidly transport them to a hospital setting. You should ideally not have to face death in that category. But we will teach you in the remaining slides how to deal with deaths that occur several hours later from burns, from amputations, or from fractures. And we'll show you how to do that. Again, the last phase where death occurs several days or weeks later is something you should not have to face. Hopefully, you will be able to be evacuated. Your victims will be able to be transported to a hospital or a treatment area where they can receive a higher level of care, and you should not have to deal with that. But as we saw with the victims of Katrina, you may have to deal with that as well. You may have to deal with not having safe water supply. You may have to deal with contamination in your neighborhood from toxic spills or from other contamination like human waste and so forth. So we'll show you how to dispose of human waste, how to be able to clean and purify water if, it, if, it, if the situation is such that help is not available within minutes, hours, or even days or week. So the situation, as you understand it now, is pretty, uh, very, pretty clear. Immediate help will not be available. There will not be a trauma surgeon. There will not be a police officer. There will not be a firefighter to help you you will start helping the people around you, you will be a rescuer, and you will save lives. The number of victims, like you saw, is going to exceed your capacity. All those who did the triage scenarios saw how there were five victims and there was one rescuer, but they quickly were able to enroll and list new rescuers by asking the walking wounded to help them. However, the number of victims will exceed the capacity. You have to identify yourself as a rescuer, you have to identify that your goal is to save as many lives as possible. This means that people who, are, who have received a non-salvageable injury should not have a great deal of time spent upon them. As we just uh, discussed, the survivors of the, of the um, event will end up assisting other victims of the same event. We had two video links for you, and when you go home, you can click on Google and go to the Clovis, and, uh, the Clovis event and the Mexico City event. Just go to Google, and we can give you the links, and it'll show you very quickly how people um, react to a um, disaster scene, uh, what a disaster scene looks like, how chaos and confusion can be quickly um, uh, treated by simple tool of triage using the start and using the RPM. Remember, the start is simple triage, rapid transport. So your action is very clear now. You have to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. This is your goal. Remember this. It will be on the post-class uh, test quiz. Greatest good for the greatest number. So we have a volunteer who is going to show us what the safety equipment is. Um, Jean, would you like to come up here in the front? Okay, so Jean is the rescuer on the scene. Is she wearing any safety equipment at this time? No. no, she is not. Could you put on some safety equipment that you might have with you? All right, go for I it. Didn't know I was gonna do this. You're, you're <laughs> going to do it right now. Yeah, you can do it. Well, there's some, there's some, there's some stuff on the table. Well, I don't have there's some stuff right no here on the table. Yeah. Okay, so right on? away she reaches for a pair of gloves. Gloves is a safety equipment. It keeps the secretions that might transmit viruses like the HIV virus or the hepatitis virus or um, the West Nile virus, any virus that can be transferred by blood or by secretions, it keeps, her, keeps that away from our hands, so she puts gloves on. So that's very good. She's putting on a mask. Could you turn around and face the class? Very good. So she puts her mask on. The mask is very important as well. If there has been some spill of toxic fumes that might uh, overcome her and then she may not be able to be a rescuer, this will help to fi filter that out. If there's been a building collapse, there'll be a lot of dust rising. If it's an old building, there may be asbestos rising as well. It won't kill her immediately, but she'll find a lawyer to sue somebody for asbestos <laughs> inhalation. So she's wearing her mask, so that's very good. She's wearing her goggles to protect her eyes from splashes. That's also very important to wear your goggles. And if you, wear glasses, glasses you, if, you wear, if you wear glasses, if you wear if you wear glasses, you may want to keep a mask that has a 
plastic shield in front of it so you can still be able to see what you're doing and wear your glasses and still have protection to your eyes. So now she's ready to be a, a rescuer. She has her safety equipment on. She Face the class. She, she's got, uh, face the camera. She's got her safety equipment on now. She's got her goggles. She's got her mask and she's got her gloves. What else does she need to be a good rescuer? Okay. She needs a helmet and what else does it say on the slide there? She needs a buddy. So she tries to find a buddy right away. She tries to see if there's anybody. <laughs> Go ahead, you have your helmet right there. So she asks somebody else to volunteer to help her and if she can find no other volunteer rescuer, she looks to the victims to see if they are walking wounded who can help her. So call for a rescue, call for a buddy. Uh, Virginia. Can you help her? Do you have any injuries? Can you walk? Yes. All right, you are her rescuer. Okay. Now, sh now you have somebody who can document for you, who can assist you in putting a person into a rescue position. So now she's a complete rescuer and she's ready to save lives. Thank you. Okay. The buddy must also put on all her safety equipment. Try to carry your safety equipment with you in your car. Try to keep a bag at work, you know, wherever you may be when you're called upon for a disaster scene. So now we're going to get into more complex things. You've learned how to do triage. You've learned how to spot the killers. Now we're going to learn how to recognize shock. Do we have somebody who can demonstrate being in shock? So we have a person here who's a, a victim of an accident, and she is exhibiting all the classic signs of shock. So these, uh, so she's lying over here. Do we have somebody who wants to volunteer to be a rescuer? <laughs> That's very good. Make sure she's a paying patient. So here she is laying on the floor. So we, so we have somebody come up to her and we try to put her into a position at which we can assess her. So we hold her head and her neck. We put one hand on the um, shoulder and on the hips and we put her over into a position so that we can assess her for shock. And we look at her and she's breathing very rapidly and very shallow breathing. Rapid breathing is any breath more than 20. So if she's breathing more than 20 times a minute. The best way is to just look at her and get an assessment rather than try to count her breathing. So she's breathing rapidly. I've determined that by doing a look, listen, and feel. I've seen her chest rise and fall. I can feel it and I can hear it. <coughs> so she's, she seems to be in shock. I look at her color and I do a capillary refill. I blanch the fingers and then I look to see when the circulation returns. And after I put pressure, I say capillary refill in my mind and I let go. And if the circulation is not back by the time I've said capillary refill, which is two seconds, remem <coughs> remember two seconds, it'll be on the quiz at the end of the test, at the end of the class. <laughs> circulation hasn't returned. She may be in shock. I touch her skin. She's very cold to the touch. She doesn't have circulation. She's in shock. So these are the signs to recognize that this person is in shock. She's unconscious or she has altered consciousness, she's breathing fast, her capillary refill is delayed, she's very pale, and she's cold to the touch. Shock, and we can also ask them to see if they have mentation to do simple commands like squeeze my hand or show a finger. How to treat shock? Cover the person to try to get them warm again and to try to restore circulation. Elevate their feet. Remember, there's, a quart of <coughs> there's a, roughly a quart of blood in each lower extremity. If, if you elevate the leg, you've given them a blood transfusion already that's significant to restore their circulating blood volume by half. The critical organs are the brain, the heart, and the lungs. So if you elevate the leg and you transfuse the blood that was in their leg back towards their chest and towards their head, you've already started the process of resuscitation. So elevate their feet and try to uh, increase circulation to their vital organs. Continue to try to maintain an open airway. If there's obvious bleeding like we learned about, try to control the bleeding and avoid rough and excessive handling. This we see a lot. We see a lot of trauma that's inflicted by rescuers who get very um, nervous and agitated, who uh, uh, become very emotional at the scene. Perhaps the victim uh, is combative, is wandering around. They may be roughly handled. And so avoid secondary injuries. We've seen uh, responders, first responders get very emotional, have an adrenaline surge and respond in an abnormal fashion with very excessive rough handling. So try to avoid rough and excessive handling. It may stir up the bleeding and cause the person to get into deeper shock. So how to identify that somebody is injured? Obviously, you'll see some signs of bruising. Look for it. If they're covered with clothes, expose their body so you can see it. Cut the clothing away. 
have a scissors in your rescue pack so that you can cut the clothing away. Look for swelling. Swelling is a sign that there may be internal bleeding. There may be swelling in the abdomen if they're bleeding inside. There may be swelling on a limb if there's a bone that's broken underneath it and is leaking blood out from the broken ends of the bone. They'll complain of severe pain. They'll say, my neck hurts. You know you're dealing with a neck injury. They'll tell you, my head hurts. You know that you're dealing with a head injury. <coughs> so listen to what they're saying. And look for obvious disfigurement. If someone is lying unconscious with their leg bent back under them, probably the leg is broken or the hip is dislocated. So if you just look, you'll be able to identify, but know what you're looking for. You're looking for bruising, you're looking for swelling, you're listening to see if they're verbalizing pain, and you're looking for obvious disfigurement. If you see somebody who has a life-threatening injury, provide immediate treatment. So if you see somebody who's not breathing, don't continue your triage. Stop there and restore their breathing by putting them into a rescue position. <coughs>